Hi there, this is Dan Connolly with BaltimoreBaseball.com, and I welcome you to our third installment of Around the Beat. And we have a uh, another special guest. I say special guest every time. I'm getting old with that. i got to figure a new terminology. But I have Sam Mellinger of the Kansas City Star, columnist of the Kansas City Star, and former uh, Kansas City Royals beat writer. Uh, he's been around the team for years now. And uh, you know, it's kind of the insight as the Orioles go into Kansas City on Friday I tell you, in switching things, Sam, one of the things that kind of bums me out is that uh, I will not be going to Kansas City, um, one of my favorite places to go. And everyone's like, kind of shocked that it's one of my favorite road trips, but it is. And I, you have a very special place in my heart because you were the first person to ever introduce me to Oklahoma Joe's. So, <laughs> so I'm glad you're here on the program, but I'm, I'm, I'm more so glad that you you got me to go to Oklahoma Joe's and have the best barbecue I've ever been to, I've ever had. It's delicious, right? Yeah. You're welcome. Tremendous. I didn't I didn't Tremendous. realize that, but yeah. You're, I like to it, spread the word. Yeah, it was it was so long ago that we didn't have GPS and you had to actually write out hand directions for me for my <laughs> hotel to it. And God, as, how as old sad, are we? Yeah, I know. As sad and pathetic as it was, Sam, I actually held on to those directions for like two or three years in my bag. So I wouldn't have to ask <laughs> you again and I could just easily go there. So uh, what a tremendous place. The best it's the best gas station I've ever eaten at, that's for sure. Right. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, so let's talk a little bit about the Kansas City Royals, and, and we'll, we'll go kind of with the Orioles and the Royals. A little bit of history here. 2014, both teams were upstarts. They ended up meeting in the American League Championship Series, and obviously to the distraught of the Baltimore Orioles fans, uh, the Royals swept them in four, went to the World Series, and lost to the San Francisco Giants. So going into 2015, it would make sense that the Orioles and the Royals were teams that people were expecting to get back there. And that really wasn't the case. And, you know, the Orioles did take the step back, as, as everyone kind of had had expected or the experts had said. Um, but the Royals went on, got to the ALCS again, beat the Blue Jays, get to the uh, the championship, the World Series, and end up beating uh, the New York Mets and are now world champions. So one would think, Sam, that all of us so-called experts would have the Kansas City Royals going back to the World Series for the third consecutive time, and that's not the case. A lot of people have a bunch of other teams. I have the Houston Astros. A lot of other uh, writers have, you know, you name it, but really not the Kansas City Royals. So why do we in the national media hate the Royals so much, Sam? <laughs> uh, that is a question that many people in Kansas City uh, ask, actually. Um, why does everybody hate us? Uh, and you know what's funny, though? It's not just the, uh, you know, kind of the national writers or national media or whatever. Uh, the computers, uh, the projection systems despise the Royals. Um, I mean, I think for the last um, three years, and certainly for the last two years, when the Royals have ended up, um, you know, in the playoffs and, and in the World Series, uh, the, the most optimistic uh, computer projection that you could ever find on them was like 83 and 79. And, and most of them were, you know, 90 losses, 87 losses. Uh, and I, I think that uh, I think there's a couple things going on, um, you know, and, and, and one may, you know, sort of have to do more with uh, the human predictions and one may have more to do with the computer predict- predictions. The, the human predictions part is uh, they don't have, uh, well, first of all, they have a, a terrible history, right? Um, the Royals for, for so long, um, you know, just been a rotten organization that loses at least 90 games every year. And so that's like part of, you know, they don't, they don't get the benefit of the doubt. Um, I also think that there's something to the idea that they don't have like a bankable star. Um, you know, they don't have, uh, I know Lorenzo King finished third in the MVP voting last year, but, um, you know, they don't have like a superstar player. They don't have, um, you know, a front line, big time stud, uh, starting pitcher. Um, and, and I, I do think that that, you know, kind of hurts them in the eyes of, you know, humans that, that are trying to figure out who's going to be good. It's easy, you know, when you think about the Angels, and the Angels aren't that good, but, you know, they've got Mike Trout, they've got the best player in baseball. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned Houston. I don't love Houston. Um, but another team that, that a lot of people are talking about is Toronto, and they've got, you know, you can you can picture Jose Bautista hitting all these home runs, and, uh, you know, Josh Donaldson and all these things. And, and I think that, you know, kind of the the, the, the Royals are more balanced. Um, than they are, you know, star driven. And, and I think that, um, you know, it's hard to, um, it's hard. And, and look, like nobody, I think, like spends hours and hours and hours doing this projection. So, like, it's hard. The Royals win 
when we're, we're comparing like the eighth best player on the roster to somebody else's eighth best player. They win when you compare the 14th best player to somebody else's 14th best player. And it's hard for us to, to sort of imagine that. Now with the computers, I think the reason that the computers um, have so consistently and way more than, than humans, I think, um, underrated the Royals is that the Royals win in a completely different and kind of bizarre way. And, you know, Sam Miller, who does a lot of the stuff with, with baseball perspectives, has talked about this, but, you know, their projections have a blind spot for the Royals. They have a blind spot for uh, superior defense, which the Royals play. They have a blind spot um, for uh, superior bullpens, which the, which the Royals have. And, uh, you know, that makes it hard. They have a blind spot, I think, for, for really good base running. And the Royals run the bases really well. Um, you know, what, what they don't do is hit a lot of home runs. Um, they don't have a great starting rotation. And, you know, I think those are kind of traditionally things that – um, that you look at for, for baseball teams. So, uh, you know, there, there's a lot going on. I, I do think that the humans more now than two years ago are high on the Royals, but I, 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 I think that just the way they're built, they're always going to be a little bit underrated. You know, I agree with you because the Orioles, again, are in the, kind of in the same boat there. And obviously, if you look at the Orioles' strengths, home run hitting is the one big thing. But if you look, you know, if you peel off the layer a little bit, I mean, you have another really, really good bullpen, perhaps not as good and dominant as the Royals, but but pretty darn good. And then you yep. have a defense which can probably rival the Royals. And, um, and you know, the Orioles, I think it was, I think Pakota had them as, as 73 wins this year. And, you know, they haven't had fewer than, than 81 wins under Buck going back to 2012. So um, they've actually had more wins than any team since 2012, and yet, you know, they're, they're predicted as, as 73. And I want to kind of hit on one of the things you said, actually both things you said, but the defense. Because that is, you know, we talked to Buck yesterday, and he was talking about the, the Toronto Blue Jays team, and he talked, you know, everyone says about the additions that they made and how good they are. But, you know, a lot of those additions came with good defensive players, too. I mean, they got Martin, they got Tulewitzki, they, you know, they got Donaldson, who's a mm-hmm. tremendous third baseman. So they strengthened their defense up, and Pilar, you know, kind of emerged. And, I mean, when you look at this Royal team with the infields they have and then Kane and, and Gordon, um, you know, Perez behind the plate, I mean, it, it is a tremendous defensive team. How much do you think that makes this team better, and how much do you think that buoys the starting pitching, which, as you said, is, is not very heralded? Yeah, it's um, – I think it's incredibly significant. I really do. Like, I mean, they have – um, if you go around the diamond, um, they are, I think Omar Infante, um, is probably the, the one exception. Um, but everybody else is above average or terrific defensively. You know, I mean, Gordon wins gold gloves. Lorenzo Kane actually hasn't won one, which I think is weird. Um, he's probably their best defensive player. Um, draw Dyson just returned from, from a strained oblique in right field. He's super fast, covers a ton of ground, has a better arm than you think for a guy his size. Eric Hosmer's won gold gloves. I mean, they, you know, Alcides Escobar won the gold glove at short. Uh, I mean, they, uh, it, it works on so many different ways. It works, um, you know, like you mentioned, it, it helps, uh, a starting rotation. It's not terrible, but certainly isn't, you know, great. It certainly isn't, you know, it's, it's, it's average or below average. Um, and, 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 and that helps in a lot of ways too, like not just, you know, getting out, but saving pitches, you know, and, and letting those guys work a little bit deeper into the game, which is something they desperately need. Um, and, and it's, it's, there's a certain, um, you know, you can pick out times where, where, um, where they save runs, where Lorenzo Kane makes, um, an amazing catch, uh, where, uh, you know, Tina Escobar made just a stupid play in Houston, um, uh, over the weekend, I think it was, or, or last week, um, where, he, you know, he covers 90 feet on on a ball going, you know, directly behind him and then get – I mean, just absolutely absurd play. So you, you can remember those, but also what they don't do is screw up, you know, kind of the routine play. And, and that's hard to, like, pick out when you're watching a game right. except for uh, when the other team does it. And, and there was an example – um, this was the game last night where uh, they were uh, – was, there, were, there were two outs, so, you know, keep that in mind. But still, uh, Mike Gershley, who I think is a really good third base coach, uh, sent Kendrys Morales um, to the plate on a ball where Justin Upton had the ball in left field. And, I mean, Morales was out by at least 10 feet and, and probably closer to 20 than 10. And it was just – it was a bad send by Gersh. I don't know why he did it, uh, but he did. And the ball beat Morales by, again, at least 15 feet. And um, Salta Lamacchia, 
uh, was the catcher and uh, just kind of took his eye off the ball and, and the ball skipped over him and, and Morales scored and that was the first run and then they ended up getting two more in the inning. That would have been the third out. And that's a play that the Royals don't screw up. That's a play that, uh, you know, when the Royals are in the field, that's the third out of the inning and there's no runs given up instead of three. And, um, you know, that's a play that the Royals used to screw up a lot, by the way, uh, until the last few years. So um, it, it's, it's more subtle. You know, um, I, I think the defense is something that, um, you know, unless you just watch the baseball tonight highlights or whatever, uh, it's something that you kind of have to watch every day to appreciate and, and to kind of understand how much it helps. But um, it, it is an enormous part of what they do. Absolutely. I mean, there's no question about it. It's, it's probably their biggest strength other than, than Wade Davis. I'm talking here with uh, Sam Mellinger of the Kansas City Star and, and co-author of The Artist Scouting with uh, longtime Kansas City Royals scout Art Stewart. It's a great read. If you haven't checked it out, you should. Um, but, Sam, you know, it's funny when, when you look at the parallels of, of these two teams, um, you know, the Orioles starting pitching is, is obviously not its strength, and it's something that, you know, that kind of has been beleaguered over the last couple of years. And, you know, people, fans will, will, will talk to me and say, they need to go out and, and get that ace, they need to go out and, and spend that money. And I make the point to them that, you know, that would be great, but, you know, those guys aren't always, you know, raising their hand to come to Camden Yards, first of all, to pitch. But <laughs> right, but right. secondly but secondly, the Kansas City Royals proved last year they had the fewest amount of innings pitched by their by a rotation in the American League and still won the World Series. So I mean you don't necessarily want to go with that blueprint and you have to have the defense and you have to have that other stuff. But I mean, how how okay does the Royals rotation have to be with guys like Volquez and, and you know and, and Kennedy and, and Young and Ventura I mean, as long as they're okay and giving you six innings, that's really the, the, the blueprint, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's that's the way that they're built. They don't need um, – if they can get their – if they can get their rotation just to be average, then that's awesome. You know what I mean? Like, if, if they have an average rotation, um, they have a terrific team. If, if by the end of the year, um, the Royals out of 15 teams have the seventh best rotation uh, in the American League, um, they're going to have the best record in the American League. I, re- I really do believe that. Um, and, you know, th- there's just – there's different ways to do it, you know. And some of this I think the Royals kind of stumbled onto, honestly, because, like, when Dayton Moore was hired um, back in 2000 and, gosh, 2006, um, you know, he said over and over so many times that, that people rolled their eyes. But, you know, starting pitching is the currency of baseball. And, you know, he grew up – as a baseball man with the Braves when, you know, the reason that the Braves won is because they had, you know, three Cy Young winners um, in their starting rotation. And that's kind of what, uh, what Dayton wanted to build here. And it just didn't work out that way. You know, the, the one really good starting pitcher that they've had over the years was Zach Greinke, who was here before Dayton was and who they right. traded actually in one of the most important deals that the Royals have made. They got lines. Okay. And I'll see the score back in that trade. So, um, you know, there's, there's just, too many different ways to do it to say that, you know, you have to hit home runs and, and have, you know, a horse at the um, top of your rotation to do it. The Royals have found, um, you know, stack up a bunch of power arms to get strikeouts in the later innings and trade power for athleticism. Um, you know, I, I don't think that the Royals have figured out the only way to win, you know, like it's, you know, baseball, probably not quite as much as other sports, but all sports I think are copycat you know, kind of situations. And, um, you know, I think the Royals are, um, you know, inspiring a lot of teams to stack up relievers. You saw a lot of teams, you know, the Yankees come to mind probably first of, you know, teams that, that signed closers when they already had closers because uh, they're trying to, you know, kind of emulate what the Royals have had. Um, but, you know, this this is the formula that has worked for the Royals with, you know, so, and some of it's payroll, some of it's a lot of other things. But, yeah, I mean, if they look at it, if, if their starting pitcher goes six innings and gives up two runs, uh, the Royals are almost for sure going to win that game. You know, if the if the starting pitcher goes six and gives up three, uh, they're going to win that game just because you're probably not going to squat on them in the last three innings, and, and you know, chances are they're going to get one three runs. Now, Dayton Moore gets a lot of credit for building this team, um, and it's kind of interesting to me because when I look back, you know, Buck Showalter is a manager that, that's considered a very, very good manager, but at the same time he kind of wears out his welcome supposedly with a reputation and, and that kind of thing. But he actually I think is the fifth or sixth longest tenured manager with his current team. And you look at some of the other other guys and you have Sosha and you have Bochi and you have Girardi. And then you have Ned Yost, who <laughs> was basically fired in early two thousand fourteen, if I remember correctly. And oh oh since then has taken the team to the World Series twice. 
Yeah. How much of this is Ned Yost, and and why have they been so successful under Ned Yost? All right. So I believe, um, and and I, I've gotten crap on this uh, before and after Ned was accepted as a good manager. So it makes me feel like I'm right. Um, <laughs> I've always believed that Ned Yost uh, is a uh, just terrible with strategy. Um, okay. I, I really do believe that, and I think that he is terrific. Um, with the clubhouse, and um, and I think that the stuff that Ned is bad at is the stuff that's most apparent when you just watch the game. You know, of um, you know, it, it's 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 a lineup. It's uh, bullpen usage before the last year or two when you started listening to Dave Island. Um, it's things like that. What what you don't see is what he's best at, which is um, belief. And, um, you know, getting the guys to, to play hard for them and kind of these, these sort of corny things, I think, is, is how it sounds. Um, but I think when you're around that team every day, you absolutely believe it. I mean, they, they get along terrifically well. Um, you know, I mean, some of these guys, like, vacation together in the off season, right. And, you know, you just don't see that a lot of times. I mean, they spend so much time together during the season. I think a lot of times you're sick of each other um, at, at the end of it. And so I think um, what Ned, Ned has done is – uh, believe in his guys, um, you know, 100% and, and unwaveringly so. And sometimes to his own detriment, but most of the times it's, it's paid off. And, you know, like one of my favorite stories, and I just heard this story for the first time um, this spring, was um, I, I think it was the first year. So Ned was hired in, in May of, um, and now I forget exactly which year it was, I think 11 or so. But anyway, he was hired. Actually, um, he was hired in 2010 because he was hired right before Buck was. That's why he gets um, – because Buck came in 2010 with the Orioles, and okay. Ned was already there. So he was so he must have been that 2010 year. I couldn't remember when they fired yeah. Trace, yeah. Um, who was living in for me here in Kansas City. But, right. Um, so it was later in that 2010 season, and the Orioles were bad. I mean, they just – you know, right. they, they had guys that just weren't ready, and, and they were losing a lot of games. And the story goes that, that there was a meeting. It was uh, David Glass, the owner, Dave Moore, the general manager, and, and Ned. And they're in the office, and, and David Glass is just, you know, uh, losing it. I mean, he, he's, he's pissed off, and, um, you know, he's angry. And at one point he says, like, I can't watch this team. This team angers me and frustrates me so much. I don't want to watch this team. And Ned, I guess I kind of pounded his hand on the table and he said, you know what, then don't watch, then don't watch. If, if it, if, um, you know, watching this team gives you that much heartburn, um, then I don't want you to watch, but just know that it's going to get better. And it was, it was a little bit of a, you know, a confrontation between a manager um, that they just hired and the owner who signs the checks, you know, and, right. and Dayton was in there and he kind of says, like, I don't think like, Ooh, you just talk back to the owner. And, but David Glass kind of, okay, like, let's see. And, and I guess that that's sort of the belief that he's always had. He's willing to, you know, sort of um, talk back to the owner. He's willing to, um, you know, stick with Alcides Escobar at the plate when nobody thinks he should. And Mike Moustak has put him in the two hole when everybody thinks that that's idiotic. And, you know, all these things because he believes in his guys and, and it's always paid off. And that's way more important than, you know, some of the strategy things, which, by the way, um, it, it's also fair to say it's been so close to backfire. I mean, you know, the, the Jordano Ventura thing in the sixth inning of the wild card game, um, you know, they almost blew that game because right. of that. And, um, you know, uh, burning Wade Davis, uh, you know, in, in game six or not didn't end up burning him, but pitching Wade Davis before what you think is going to be an hour long rain delay when you don't think you'll have right. him on the other side of the rain delay. I mean, there, there's been strategic mistakes that he's made that he's been able to get out of, but, um, he's been so good in the clubhouse, so good, you know, sort of um, with those guys that, that it kind of covers up a lot of other uh, weaknesses. We're talking here on BaltimoreBaseball.com with Sam Mellinger, the uh, the columnist, sports columnist for Kansas City Star. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny, we're talking about mistakes and sticking with your guys. And one of the things we've seen with World Series teams is sometimes they fall in love with their own players and they give them money, contracts that maybe they shouldn't have or maybe are emotionally – uh, tied to, and then they don't pan out. Um, and, you know, there were a couple key guys or guys that, that came in that were basically rentals for the Royals this past year in Zobris, in, in Cueto. But the Royals decided to give a four-year, $72 million deal to Alex Gordon, um, who, you know, you, you wonder if he really truly is an $18 million guy based on, you know, his stats and that kind of stuff. But how important was it to 
you know, lock up Alex Gordon as far as the world organization is concerned. And, you know, he started out slow. Is that just the first couple of weeks of the season? Or do you think that there's you – know, maybe he's put a little extra pressure on himself. I mean, you know, we all remember when he came up and he was, you know, supposed to be the, the, the next whomever, and it took him a while to, to get to that point. You say the next whomever. He was the next George Brett. George and, Brett, right, um, right. And it was kind of like, you know, at the time he played third base. He had the Sandy Bond hair. Um, right. You know, hit left-handed, all that stuff, and which I always thought was the dumbest thing in the world. Uh, and I was in, in my mind, I was like, I'm never going to write that stupid thing that he's the next George Brett until George Brett said, "I'm honored by the comparison because he's better than I was at that age." I'm like, wow, wow. <laughs> that is uh, who 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 has more pressure than that, right? But right. Um, so anyway, about that contract, um, they had to do it. At that money, um, they had to do it. I think what what they they were convinced that they were going to lose him in the off season. They thought that um, he was going to, you know, somebody was going to blow them out of the water and, you know, give him a hundred million dollar plus contract. And um, they got lucky in a lot of ways. The Jason Hayward going from the Cardinals to the Cubs um, worked in their favor and on a few different levels. Um, but I, I think that they, uh, it was important because on a team that is uh, like super emotional. Uh, I mean, this, this team, um, you know, bat flips and they, they talk and they, uh, you know, they dump Gatorade on each other after, you know, a, a five to two win in April. Um, you know, they're, they're a really, really emotional group. And uh, most of the time that's really good. Um, they, they play with passion, they play with energy, um, all those things. But, um, you, you know, the, the more you talk to guys around that team, the more they say that they need Alex Gordon's influence. He's like the one, you know, kind of steady guy. Uh, on a team full of, of, you know, sort of up and down e- emotional guys. He he also, um, you know, they, well, look, like a lot of this is sort of, um, you know, intangible, but, um, you know, he's the hardest worker on the team and it's not even close. And that's not to say that there aren't hard workers on the team. He's just a ridiculously obsessive worker. And, and I think that that's a good influence. I think that um, it's a good thing to retain your own players, especially the one um, that, that, that want to be there. Um, he, he's also a really good baseball player. Um, you know, I mean, he's, he's a terrific defensive player. Uh, his numbers, um, you know, he's probably had his best career offensive year, um, but he's still, you know, a, a 120 OPS plus kind of guy. And, uh, you know, he is off to a terrible start. But the one thing that I would say about that is three of the last four years, he's gotten off to a really terrible start. And, and each of those years, uh, you know, his numbers at the end of the year – have been really good and, you know, maybe not as counting numbers last year, but that's because he missed, you know, two and a half, three months with, with the groin injury. Um, but he's, uh, I, I don't think that the Royals regret that contract at all. Uh, I think they were surprised that they were able to get Alex at that price. Uh, there are a lot of people, you know, both in the clubhouse and in the front office that, that were kind of almost resigned to the idea that, that he was going to go somewhere else for more money than the Royals could spend. So, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, emotionally, spiritually, and, you know, just like tangible baseball production. I think that, you know, that was, that was a really important deal for them to get done. It's kind of interesting because in parallels with the Orioles, you think about Nick Markakis not signing Markakis to a four-year, yep. $40 million deal. And, you know, and then they took a step backwards last year. They obviously didn't sign uh, Nelson Cruz either, but Markakis was kind of the Gordon of the Orioles. So it's kind of an interesting uh, comparison. So I'm you know, it's funny to, you say that. I'm sorry to interrupt real quick, but yeah. like the, the Markakis thing, I think there's a lot of similarities in those guys because I, I know that the Royals front office adores Nick Markakis. They love the way that guy plays and the way that you know he cares himself and all that. So I, I think there are a lot of similarities there. But I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, absolutely, absolutely. And and again, we're talking to Sam Ellinger with the uh, Kansas City Star. And now that we talk, we talked about the Royals for a while, but I do got to push it a little bit over to the Orioles, especially from someone kind yeah. of looking from afar. I mean. You know, this team was 81-81 and 81 last year. They started out hot beginning of this year, winning the, their first seven. Um, they have one of the best managers in baseball, and I don't think that's just a biased thing. He really is that good. Um, and they have a very good bullpen, and they can absolutely positively smash baseballs into souvenirs. So my question is, sitting from afar and, and watching this team, and getting you'll be seeing him this weekend, um, what do you see in these Baltimore Orioles, and what do you expect out of these Baltimore Orioles, especially in the American League East? Yeah, I I think the the AL East like there's never been a year I shouldn't say never but there hasn't been a year in the last like, five years I don't think where I felt like I have a, a real good handle on what 
that division is going to be. It just seems like, um, you know, they're all unpredictable, but it just, it seems to me like the AL East is more unpredictable than most. And I, I just, I don't know. You know, I, I love their lineup. Um, Manny Machado is, is one of my favorite players in baseball. And I absolutely love the guys like skill. I love how he plays. Um, you know, I love that, that he defends any hits. Um, you know, I mean, they've got, they've got a lot of power and, you know, just like we were, we were talking about, um, you know, the Royals. One thing I guess I didn't mention with, um, you know, how much they focused on defense and athleticism. A lot of that is, you know, sort of a nod at their ballparks. Um, they have this huge outfield. Uh, they have to, they have to cover ground. They need those athletes, um, to do that. And in a similar way, um, you know, if you're playing at Camden Yard, um, which I know you guys share this all the time is one of those beautiful favorite baseball stadiums, um, you know, in, in the league, um, it's also short, right? It's the, the, the 368 in the alleys and, and they built a lot of power. And, you know, I think that if you're a pitcher and you're going in there um, and, you know, you see Chris Davis and uh, Machado and, and, you know, uh, Trumbo, I know he strikes out a lot, but, you know, can hit the ball a long ways. Um, you know, a lot of these guys that, that, that can hit a lot of home runs, I mean, that is a dangerous, dangerous thing. So, um, you know, I know, just like with the Royals, you know, Ian Kennedy maybe gives them the benefit of the doubt, although $70 million probably gives more of the benefit of the doubt. But, you know, it's, it's attractive for pitchers to go pitch at Coffin Stadium. And like you were saying earlier, it's not attractive for pitchers to go uh, to Camden Yards. But, you know, if they can get that bullpen um, where they need it, then, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know why – um, you know, I know everybody's on Toronto, um, and, and I think the reasons for that are obvious. But uh, you know, Baltimore's got a really good team. I you know, I don't think anybody should be surprised if they're like that at the end of it. I agree with you. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how far your team goes, um, because the Royals just they just are seem to be built not only for 162, but for for those little things that need to be done in the in the playoffs. And and that's maybe one, the one criticism with the Orioles in the last few years. They haven't been able to do those little things. Um, you know, we go back to game four of the, the 2014 ALCS where the Royals scored two runs in the first inning on a grounder to first base um, mm-hmm. that Pierce tried to go home with. And it was just one of those, you know, it was a bang, bang play, got past uh, the catcher, and they scored two runs. Clarity hits a solo homer, and that's all they can do, and they lose two to one. So, I mean, you know, and, and that's that's kind of the the way the Royals kind of were built to do those little things and take advantage of the mistakes. Um, and the Orioles, because they haven't had much on base percentage, you know, have been pretty low towards the uh, the bottom of the American League most most years in the last say four or five. Um, you know, that's something that's that's kind of a concern. But if they can do that, if they can improve on that, if you know, if some of the guys that they've added can really help, they should be a good team too. So we may be able to get together in October again. Who knows? That'd be fun. I'll take you to Oklahoma Joe. And we get, get to go to Oklahoma Joe. See, we came all the way. That's what good writers are. We start at something, we come all the way around. So. <laughs> I want to thank uh, my guest here on, on BaltimoreBaseball.com and Around the Deep, Sam Mellinger of the Kansas City Star. It's a great newspaper. He's a great columnist. Check out his book as well with Art Stewart, The Art of Scouting. And, uh, Sam, thanks again, man, for coming on with me. Yeah, I enjoyed it, Dan. Anytime.